Welcome to Courageous and Just Conversations on Faith in Challenging Times. I am Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary and Theologian in Residence at Trinity Wall Street, both in New York. I am happy to be here today in Denver at St. John's Cathedral with the Reverend Canon Broderick Greer, who is an Episcopal priest, a canon of this cathedral, and well known on social media and for his popular podcast series, Mile High Theology. Broderick, thank you for having me here today, and thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Dean Douglas, for being with us at St. John's. We are delighted to have you well, here. It's good to be here. Let's jump right in. Broderick, I say, this is Broderick Greer, an Episcopal priest. But Broderick Greer was born and raised Baptist in Fort Worth, Texas, yes. is it? And I have heard you say in other conversations that the first theologian in your life was your mother. And now here you are, an Episcopal priest that in so many respects defies what it means to be born and raised in the Black Baptist tradition. How'd you get here, Broderick? So for me, the journey really began um, I think I sang my first church solo at, at age two at, at Mount Carmel Missionary Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas. I was baptized there at age eight. It's where my parents were married, um, and it's where my grandmother was the minister of music for 40 years. And so that, that, those memories loom large in my imagination theologically and personally. When I was 13, I left Mount Carmel and became a part of the Church of Christ, which is a denomination that's mainly in the American South. They are known for not using instrumental music in worship. They sing a cappella, four-part harmony, and it's congregational singing and style. Basically, um, I can look back and know that I was looking for a more um, concrete, fundamentalist, if you will, answer to what I thought was an issue of my being queer in some way. And that church offered, you know, specific answers to all of these different quandaries and had a very structured youth program. And so it was um, a meaningful time for me. It was a, an important time for me uh, being a part of the Church of Christ. And then when I was 18, I went to a Church of Christ University in Tennessee. Hmm. And there, I began reading N.T. Wright, who is a bishop in the Church of England and a New Testament scholar, and was introduced for the first time to the Book of Common Prayer and to Anglican Christianity. And um, I went through discernment and ended up going to Virginia Seminary in Alexandria for three years. So that, that is the, the quick and easy version. Well, I, I want to play with this for a while and stay here for a moment. You talk about uh, your, the theological roots and who you were theologically and how your upbringing in this black faith tradition uh, really centered you theologically. Our family had been in Texas, we know, since the 1850s. And what that cued me to is the form of Christianity that I was raised in, this black Baptist, some might call it fundamentalist uh, tradition, was formed in the crucible of, of white supremacy, of Jim and Jane Crow, um, of, of dehumanization really built on the foundation of Western Christian theology. And they were in some way able to find a compelling and beautiful story of resistance um, that defined my upbringing. I remember our, our pastor, and, and he and I would have um, many theological disagreements at this point in my life, but I do remember that he would often preach from the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs mm -hmm. and talk about um, the, I guess it's the protagonist in that story who we perceive now as being this Afro-Semitic, Afro-Asiatic woman. 
Um, and she would talk about her skin being dark, her skin being black and beautiful. And those were the kinds of sermons that I grew up hearing. Um, the presence of Afro-Asiatic people, Afro-Semitic people within the biblical text, um, who in many ways looked like us, uh, who we could imagine sounded like us. So as you say that, Broderick, you and I are a part of a denominational tradition, Episcopal Church, yes. that doesn't look like us. Exactly. And we are also a part of a denominational tradition that, in fact, enslaved was a part of an enslaving tradition. And certainly, as uh, the Episcopal Church during the period of slavery tried to, quote unquote, evangelize or Christianize those who were enslaved, wanted to make very clear to them that conversion to Christianity did not mean, salvation did not mean freedom. So, Broderick, how do you live in that contradiction? And, and, and more significantly, what does that mean for who you are in the Episcopal Church? What difference does that make? to who you are in the Episcopal Church? So one of, one of kind of the glories of Anglicanism, I would say, is its ability to be flexible and its ability um, to give permission to people to have ambiguity and mystery. And I live in that ambiguity and mystery all the time and I'm very conscious of um, in many ways, being a part of a tradition that justified the enslavement of, of my family, of my people. It seems very early on, I mean, there was Absalom Jones who um, in many ways forged the road for so many of us in the Episcopal Church. The first person of African descent to be ordained in the Episcopal Church. And if Absalom Jones at that time in the midst of enslavement could forge a road for himself, um, then I feel very comfortable doing the same for myself and others in our tradition. What difference does that make for who you are in that church, even as you talk about living in the contradiction of that and being in, uncomfortable in that? Okay, but what difference does that make uh, in ministry? What does that look like? I think that that's what I bring to the Episcopal Church and to the Anglican tradition is, is this rootedness in, in Southern blackness, um, in Southern black hospitality, um, in the Southern black imagination that says there's plenty good room in God's kingdom. So for me, um, in this day and age, it is um, having a table, not a wall, having a bridge, not a wall, um, having these various spaces that we create together where we don't lose our distinctiveness. So where are those tables? Uh, where's the church? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of your work, and one of the phrases that you use often that I really appreciate is crucified classes. So there are crucified classes of people and if we are followers of the crucified and risen one, we're always looking for those crucified classes. So, of course, I think about um, the uprising in Ferguson in 2014. And I was there, you know, two weeks after Michael Brown died. And on the streets of Ferguson, which were basically shut down completely, I met numerous people from that community who I asked one person, how long do you plan to be out here? And she said, until justice is done. Um, people who previously weren't voiceless, but were unheard. Mm -hmm. uh, people who had exorbitant uh, basic taxes on, on their existence through being stopped incessantly by police over and over again. Uh, for petty offenses or no offense at all. Um, that crucified class of people who are bearing the cross right along with Jesus, but um, white supremacist constructs keep people from seeing that. Um, I think about um, 
the number of people who went to women's marches in 2017, um, who said the government is not going to take away uh, my right to choose, is not going to take away my embodied autonomy. Um, I think about um, people at our borders, as you mentioned earlier, who are fighting for their right to, to asylum, their right to, to live in peace and to live unthreatened by physical violence. Um, it's, it's church in a way that many of us have not thought of it before. Um, church in those places of chaos. Um, but often when we see chaos in scripture, whether it's in Genesis 1 and 2, uh, whether it's on the day of Pentecost, whether it's at the ta Tower of Babel, um, later in Genesis, we're cued by chaos to the fact that God's spirit is up to something good and just, um, and in, in many ways, ordering, um, ordering that chaos. Yeah, so, I, you know, that in chaos is sort of those kairos moments. It's in these situations of uh, crises and chaos that we say theologically that the presence of God is, is that God is so present. So, Hal, I, I'm going to keep pushing you on, on this thing, Broderick. How is the, the institution that calls itself church present, or how should it be present? Mm. Or is it? The... <laughs> Those are challenging questions. I, I would say, for instance, um, when I was in Ferguson, one of the things that I saw that was most indicting of Christian people was that the pastors in the community, many of the pastors in the community were wearing vests that said clergy, these like, you know, um, yellow or orange bright vests. And they were often sitting in the front seat of the police car with the police, not on the streets with the people. Um, they were in cars with power. And so that was the church, in many ways, taking a side in that uprising, in that conflict. Um, then you have um, Reverend Sekou on the streets, Tracy Blackman. Um, Starsky Wilson, um, pastors in, in St. Louis who were on the streets with the people. So you had the church in two different places at once, um, some taking the side of the crucified class, some taking the side of the crucifying class. Um, so so the, the church was doing two different things so at one time. So which of those is church? <laughs> <laughs> I think they're both church. I would say that Christ, the real presence of Christ, was seen most fully on the streets of Ferguson with people demanding that their humanity be acknowledged. Not in the police car, mm -hmm. not among the classes of people who are stripping them of their humanity and of their dignity. So I want to talk about what it means for you to be a black queer man in this church and what theological differences that make or, or does it? It means not ignoring the world as it is. Um, I cannot gloss over police violence. I cannot gloss over the fact that Tree of Life Synagogue was targeted because it's Jewish, and that 11 people were killed because they were Jewish in 2018. So for me, practically, that means having prayers of the people that reflect that. But on a more personal level, it means being present in those places that we often, as Christian people, as baptized people, just aren't, and so I, put my collar on and went to Temple Emmanuel here in Denver, as many, many religious people did on that Sunday after, and sat as guest, not as host, and just listened to the lament of Denver's Jewish community. Sometimes that means just listening. Um, 
that meant getting on a bus um, and being on the road for 12 hours to get to St. Louis when I was in seminary. Um, not there to solve anything, uh, not there to, to, to bring resolution to anything, to, to give you know, a neat, nice box and, and package to anyone there, but to be a witness, uh, to hear people suffering, uh, to listen uh, to what they are going through. Yes, it, uh, and I can affirm that, that there's a part of what it means to be uh, part of an incarnate faith tradition is you show up. And so it is, um, going back to, to, to so much of what you've been talking about lately, of being proximate, of having those relationships that, that cross lines that traditionally have existed. Um, um, and I think that's the scandalous nature of the gospel, that God in Christ is willing to cross lines of propriety, mm -hmm. um, that God risks God's reputation for love on our behalf, um, to be close to us, to be proximate to us. And so I think the church is at its best when it's willing to risk its reputation mm -hmm in order to be near those who are being crucified. What do you say to the fact that we often think about the people in this country, the Christians in this country, who supported the Make America Great Again vision in the 2016 election. And we uh, often hear touted the fact that 86% of white evangelical Protestants supported this vision. What's often not mentioned uh, is the fact that, well, so did 56 to 58 percent of non-evangelical white Protestants. So did 60 percent of white Catholics support this vision. So that the majority of white Christian America supported the Make America Great Again vision, which we know now to be a vision, uh, if we didn't know it before, for those who some didn't know it before. It before. Yeah, some, some of us knew it before. Uh, to the moment that uh, it was articulated is make America quote unquote great again. But we knew that it was a vision uh, that was uh, laden in white supremacist values and that projected a misogynistic, xenophobic, uh, and LGBTQ phobic toxic culture. And so what do you say to your, we're in a church that uh, we have been told that is now whiter than America was at its whitest. What do you, what do you say to your white Christian brothers and sisters uh, who support such a vision? Ours is a faith in a crucified and risen person, a brown person, if you will, Palestinian Jew, descending from Afro-Asiatic people. Jesus is not on the side of those who would be sympathetic to the Ku Klux Klan or to those who would be sympathetic to ethno-nationalism. Jesus is on the side of those who are receiving the brunt of ethno-nationalism. Um, who are receiving the brunt of white supremacist violence and, and these violent white supremacist visions. Um, and, and the people on the other side, um, their vision is completely different. They're either not hearing about politics from their pulpit, or if they're hearing about it, they're saying, Voting is a deeply personal thing, and we shouldn't talk about this in church. And again, it's, it's that polite culture that is very foreign to me. Um, our pastor growing up never told us who to vote for, but we had values that we followed when we did vote. Um, and, and how are people being formed morally in such a way that they can sit in church on Sunday and cast a ballot 
that is diametrically opposed to the gospel on Tuesday? What, what version of the gospel are they hearing? I want to end with one last question, and we are at our end, and that's, what does justice look like for you? What would a just earth look like? I think it's, it's consistent with the prophetic vision in Micah. I think it's Micah 4, so I'm not Baptist anymore, so I can't call, you know, recall the text like yeah, I want to. Yeah, you've truly become <laughs> Episcopalian now. <laughs> but what are, you, what are you envisioning? I think what Micah 4 has this vision. It's an agrarian vision, but I think it's consistent with, with my ancestry, that each person has a tree that they live under. And the tree is, is this cue for us in a literary sense of security and self-sufficiency of sustenance. And that tree in 2018 might be Wi-Fi. Um, that tree might be clean water. That tree might be um, security from, from coastal flooding. Um, in so many parts of the world that are experiencing um, what the rest of us will eventually experience from climate change. Um, fill in the blank. It's whatever people need to live and thrive and flourish in God's presence on this earth. Um, that's the vision that I see that people are given the space to be themselves, are given the space for self-determination, um, are given the space to dream and think and relax. Um, in a capitalist economy, relaxation is not something, rest is not something that's usually factored in. Um, but in God's economy, rest and play and joy are central and non-negotiable. And, and that's the vision of a just future that I share.